One. No. I think you need to turn me up, apparently. <laughs> it's really lovely to see you all chatting this morning. It's, um, yeah, what families do, don't we? Yeah. So, um, and welcome to those joining us online also. Have, where are all the children this morning? We've got children up there. We've got youth, teens over there. Yeah, have we got your attention? I need you to shout out to me what's so special about today. <laughs> Very good. So happy Father's Day to all the dads, whether you're a biological dad, an adoptive dad or a spiritual dad. We just want to encourage you and uplift you this morning because you as a father are so vitally important in a child's life, more so now than ever. So... Um, Know that, yeah, what you do is important. And, you know, as a father, think about what legacy you want to leave um, for your children, to, you know. And the most, and most important and the best example is the Word of God, the inspired Word of God, uh, our Heavenly Father. So I'm just reminded in, because this is why we're here today, Sunday, because we're honouring our Father in heaven. So in Psalm 103, David reminds us of the Father's love. With my whole heart... With my whole life, with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, the holy God. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. That sounds great, doesn't it? How could I ever forget the miracles of your kindness you've done for me? You kiss my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done. You've healed me inside and out from every disease. You've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You've crowned me with love and mercy. Thank you, Father. He's a wonderful Father. I couldn't do without him. His love is so great. Even though I have a, a great earthly dad, my heavenly Father, you know, is, is, is amazing. So as we come before his holy presence this morning with singing, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Give him thanks. Praise his wonderful and glorious name. Okay? Amen. Thanks, worship team. Good morning. My challenge to you this morning is to dance. So let's stand. The aisles are clear for a reason. Feel free to use them. If you, if you get a little bit excited and your feet need to move, feel free to move. Feel free to clap and uh, we're going to worship the king. Because he is good. Let's go. The song in my heart, the song in my soul, the song I was born to sing. It's your song of freedom. Again. I'll sing in the darkness, I'll laugh in the rain, rejoice in your love again. It's your song of freedom, now I'm free to dance again. It's your spirit brings me liberty, your breath of life will set me free. 
sorrows in the desert when the pain hits you are constant ever present you're the song of my heart in the shadows in the sorrows in the desert when the pain hits you are constant ever present you're the song of my heart one more time The joy, 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 making me hope though I'm broken, I am running into your arms.
Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And washes me 
whiter than the snow, than the snow, my Jesus, God's precious song that his blood has saved my soul as the apostle Paul would say I like what Michelle says sometimes good morning family as the apostle Paul being a good encourager he would say he said to the Galatians church and he would probably would say if he is here today grace to you and peace from God our father and from the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. We're certainly in a present evil age today. According to the will of our God, our Father, to him be the glory. We're here today to give him the glory today. You know, it's good to know that it's God's will to deliver us from this present evil age. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says, He is the same. Yesterday, today and forever. He doesn't change. He is the same God. I'm going to Colossians chapter 2 and it says, as we think about, as again as we think about the cross right at this time, the death and resurrection of Jesus. In verse 6, from the English version, it says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Corresponding action, we receive and we walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as we have been taught. Being taught and knowing knowing what God wants and abounding with thanksgiving. That's an important part of our life, being thankful for everything that God has done for us. In chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, enduring everything with perseverance and patience joyfully, having a joyful heart. I got written in my Bible, a gladness, having gladness of heart, giving thanks to the Father, our Heavenly Dad. It's Father's Day. You know, he is our heavenly dad. Verse nine, chapter 2, verse 9 says, In him lives all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of God dwells in Christ. Jesus came in bodily form to walk here on the earth and to bring salvation to us, to pay the price. And it now goes on to say, And you, we, are complete in him. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every one of us that belong to him. He lives in us or he abides in us. If we look at Psalm 91, it says, um, he who dwells in the secret place of the most of the most high shall abide. Abide means in the Hebrews to come sit with me. He comes and sits beside us, even though he lives in us. He has the answer to every question and every need because he helps us. He helps us. The Apostle Paul was a a great teacher and still teaches us today. And he said, follow me as I follow Christ. 
Even if you don't like me, follow me, my example in the things that I do. In Job 22, 21, it says, Acquaint yourself. This is from the Amplified Version. Acquaint yourself with God. Means to agree with God and to show yourself to be conformed to His will. Conform to His will and be at peace. And you said, it goes on to say in that scripture, be conformed to His will and be at peace. You shall prosper and with great good and shall and great good shall come upon you from the Amplified Version. Be followers, be led by the Spirit. You know, there was a preacher, true story. He loved fast cars, loved these powerful cars, just like the Bathurst cars. And the, um, his friends decided that they were going to get, have him, give him an opportunity to go and have a drive of one of these cars. So they teed it up with a professional driver at the racetrack. And they went to the racetrack on this day and they took him there and here were these two cars on the track. And he said, you're going, and he meets the driver, the professional driver, and the driver says, you're going to drive this car on your own because, but I'll be with you. I'm going to drive the other car. He says, what I want you to do, he says, I want you to follow me. I want you to keep your bumper against my bumper and you do what I do. If I go high on the track, you go high on the track. If I go low on the track, you go low on the track. If I go down fast down through all the, the valleys and the hills or wherever they go, he said, you follow close behind me. And so they did it. And the, and the pastor, he did that. He followed through. Wherever he went, he followed. And at the end of the race, the driver comes back and he shakes his hand and says, you are the only driver that's come as a, as a novice to drive on this track that's done it at a record time because you did what I did told you to do because I knew the car. I knew what it could do. All you had to do was to drive it and to follow me. That's what God, we need to be doing to be followers. The same spirit, I've said this scripture before, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Say, he lives in me. For in him, Colossians 2.1, 2.11 says, We were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. In other words, our old sinful nature, the old man was cut off because Jesus shed his blood for our sin on the cross. He took the rap in our place. There's a, there is a significance in the cross of Christ for us today in this time. By the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, God did it for us. It's nothing that we could do. Jesus took the rap. Before we being dead in our sin, separated from God, connected to the sinful nature with no, with no hope, God he resurrected us together with Christ. Having forgiven us all our sins, there was no stone unturned, all our transgressions, all our faults and everything. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. Having cancelled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting or the note that was contrary to us, the legal demands in force against us, and carried the death sentence, the eternal death sentence. God sat aside and cleansed us completely. Away, he cleansed our sins away, renewing us. This is what that God took all our stuff, all our sin, the inherited nature the guilt 
the iniquity, the note against us that will separate us from God and cancel sin. What did God do with it? But this is what really stands out to me. He took our sin and he nailed it to the cross. That's what's so significant about the cross. Because who was on the cross? Jesus. He bore our sin. Our sin was in his body. It was nailed to the cross. You know, Satan thought he had it in the bag, all stitched up. But he didn't. I'd hate to say whose phone that is. So right there in the pit of hell, you know, Satan thought he had it all done. But God said, it was me who nailed him to the cross. I, I was the one that nailed him to the cross. I nailed your sin to the cross, your sin. So right there in the pit of hell, as Satan was celebrating the victory, God stepped in disarmed the principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness stripped Satan of all the power openly making a show of him and he stood there and he couldn't do a thing about it God had the victory that's awesome God took away the keys of the kingdom off Satan and gave it back to us. He forgave all our sins, healed all our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was on Jesus, nailed to the cross, and by his stripes we were healed and made whole. We receive it by faith. We receive it by faith. Exodus 15, 21 says, I am the Lord that heals, heals you. Hebrews 13 says, He is the same yesterday, today and forever. Malachi 3, 8 says, He never changes. Malachi 3, 6. Glory to God. Glory to God. And the bell's ringing. <laughs> so let's stand together. As we take this bread, this is my body, Jesus said, that was broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me as we remember what Jesus did for us. We take the cup. This is my blood which was shed for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bert. I actually really liked what Bert said in Colossians there. As you therefore have received Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So as we continue our worship to God this morning with our tithes and offerings, let us remember why we do. You know, sometimes when we, um, it, it seems like the church is asking for your money when we go and collect it. But it's actually not a legal mandate. It's a loving principle. And Abraham and Jacob did it even before the law existed. So we give as a worship unto the Lord. Malachi reminds us that we are to bring our tithe into the storehouse, which is our local church. So we're bringing it in. We honour God when we give back to him 
Because when we do, we acknowledge he is our source. Everything we have comes from his hands, or he's given us the ability to accomplish or earn it. Deuteronomy 8.18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is, as it is this day. So when we give, it also conditions our heart against a natural tendency to be selfish or greedy. I don't know whether you feel that way, but I think I've been that way at times. So this has been a discipline and then just a natural part of our life that um, we honour God and it's um, such a blessing to honour him. Um, Matthew 23, 23, Jesus also warns the scribes and the Pharisees. They did pay a tithe, but they did it to look good. Um, but they neglected the weightier matters of the law, which was justice, mercy and, mercy and faith. But he, was, he also reminds, these you ought to have done, which is just justice, mercy, mercy and faith, without leaving the others undone, which is the tithe and the offerings. So there's a balance in our spiritual matters. So if you'd like to uh, pray with me and then the ushers will collect the tithe. Lord, we thank you that you're our source and our provider. Help us to manage what you have given us faithfully. We give you a portion of what you have given us so we can honour you. Help us to grow in your ways so as not to become greedy or selfish. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you, ushers. We'll just wait while the ushers do that. Thanks. Thanks, ushers. Um, with announcements this morning, we do have one to start off with. It's a little bit, it's sad, but it's, it's uh, a celebration at the same time. Uh, for any of you that knew um, Lorraine Erickson, originally from Dumbula, she's passed away. Um, when did we work out? Was Thursday or Friday? One of those days, sorry. Um, but we just want to lift her and the family up. She was an amazing woman that prayed for many souls and I believe she did it with Ross and I without us even knowing because there was paths that we met just through craft and different other things and she was such a blessing as an intercessor a prayer warrior and a teacher so um, she's in glory now and we celebrate that but we just want to honor and her thank her and father we just hold her before you we thank you for the wonderful woman she was and a woman of faith that honored you and um, showed by example the love that you have for each and every one of us. Father, we just uphold her family at this time. We ask that you comfort and bless them. As they just um, have this time, um, they lost their mother, which nobody ever wants, Father, but they know where she's going and they celebrate in that. But we thank you that you are comforting and then bringing them peace in this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Um, apparently, they're not sure where the funeral is. It may be in Mariva and it may be next Thursday. So maybe later on, check it with the office and they might have some more details if you're uh, wanting to go to the funeral. So with birthdays, we have Annabelle's today. Where's Annabelle? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> she had a party on Saturday with her um, niece. Is that right? Have I got it right? Um, yeah, um, and she turned one, yeah. <laughs> so that was wonderful. Uh, Anita is on the 7th. What day is that, Anita? What day is that? Thursday. Thursday, okay. So just remember Anita on Thursday. <laughs> Send her a text. And Bert is on, you must, must be Friday then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, if you'd just like to quickly gather around these, these people, if you're close by, just reach out your hand. Father, we thank you 
for your children that love you so much. Um, and we celebrate their birthday with them um, this today and, and this coming week. We ask that you be with them and just, um, yeah, bring favour and blessing on their day. Just let them have a special time in you, in Christ, uh, and with their families as they celebrate. We just want to honour them and give them, um, yeah, a, a blessed day in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we have two anniversaries. We have Adrian and Liza. There's been celebrations everywhere. Liza turned 50 last week, so <laughs> how many years married? 18, lovely. And Marvin and Crystal um, is on there today too, so I'm not sure where they are, but wherever they are, um, Marvin and Crystal, we congratulate you on your wedding anniversary too. So Father, we just bring these precious people before you. We thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you that you have um, blessed them and honoured them You've taught them your ways. You've stood by them as they've stood in, in you. It's a three-strand three, three um, strand cord, Father, that um, never breaks. So we, we thank you that they're rooted in you and that you will bless them as they continue on in the following years. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So team two is on, which is George and Debs. Um, they're up in Gelatin at the moment. Um, Preaching and just while we remember Pastor Darrell and I think Trish is with him um, at Clearwater Ministries in Cairns. So, uh, Father, we just thank you for those ministering in other places. Father, we just ask that you bless them and that, that, that your word goes out um, and touches the hearts of those that, that they're ministering to. And we thank you also in Jesus' name again. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Um, we have the Marriage Enrichment uh, Session 3 seminar on Wednesday. We've been really enjoying that. So um, it's quite humorous, um, teaching the truth with humour, which is wonderful. Uh, doors open at 6.30pm. Uh, is Youth Life on Tuesday night? Yeah? Yep, still? I've, yep. Uh, and Youth Camp, just a reminder, that's on the 30th of September to the 2nd of October. And we just want to thank those that have donated stuff already to help that camp, um, you know, be a, a success. And oh, if anyone um, seen The Sound of Freedom, the movie, the other night, some of us went um, to the drive-in to see it. It's an absolutely amazing true, st a movie about, um, true story about a US um, government agent and how he rescues um, children from sex trafficking. Just an absolutely eye-opener. I think after watching that, I would never leave my children anywhere. <laughs> But we, we trust in God, don't we? <laughs> um, but, you know, things happen and it's just amazing how a spiritual dad, his heart for these kids and what he's done and other men are like him. Um, so the last showing of that is at the Melanda Theatre at 1.45 this afternoon, if anyone's interested in seeing that. Um, I think that's it. So I'm just going to call Judy forward, please, because... We have a special morning with the children also. Uh, they have some poems and we've got some gift giving for the dads. But Judy's just going to explain a little bit about what the, the children have been doing and the youth. Okay, thank you. Just, yeah. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers today. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, hope all the children remembered their fathers. My daughters remembered their father, but I forgot to give him his present this morning. <laughs> I've got till they ring this afternoon, so that's fine. I've still got time. Okay, but um, last week we started to work on Father's Day in junior church and unfortunately a lot of the children seem to be celebrating with their fathers today. So we've got the Searles children. <laughs> so they, can you come out please? But they did some poems. So... <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Would you like to go first, Liana? <laughs> This is my acrostic poem for my dad. My father is fantastic, amazing, terrific, hilarious, excellent, and really cool. From Ethan. <laughs> what is a dad? A dad is a person who is loving and kind, and he often knows what you have on your mind. He's someone who listens, suggests, and defends. A dad can be one of your very best friends. 
proud of your triumphs, but when things go wrong, a dad can be patient and hopeful and strong. In all that you do, a dad's love plays a part. There's always a place for him deep in your heart. And each year that passes, you're even more glad, more grateful and proud to just call him your dad. Thank you, Dad, for listening, caring, forgiving and sharing, but especially for just being you. Uh, okay, hi. Apparently I have to pray for all the fathers, so... <laughs> Wasn't volunteered, voluntold. Anyway. Your dad is really proud of you. <laughs> anyway, thanks God that we get to have dads. Thank you that they get to love and care about us. Thank you that they get to be with us and help us through life. Thank you that they've set us up with full success and thank you that we get to love them back. Please bless them and help them until Father's Day next year. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you guys. Give another clap, yeah. What a great job. You can tell they're learning a lot in, in youth um, junior church, aren't you, to, to be able to do that. Tracy is going to, with the children, just hand out some gifts for the fathers. So just be blessed. Trish has gone to excelled herself <laughs> and so has Elizabeth too <laughs> in honouring you dads this morning. While they're doing that this morning what we're doing is we're having four of our church family fathers come up and share this morning. which is going to be wonderful to hear their testimony. Well, I don't know. It's not necessarily a testimony. They have questions, but I'm sure within it, it's part of that. So I'm just going to read what Pastor Daryl said. So we're going, Gary's going to be speaking first, then Chris, then David, and then Phil. And the questions they're going to speak on... Uh, what influence did your father have on your life? How did fatherhood change your life? And how important or value, valuable are fathers of faith in our church? And Pastor David's going to share with us um, those things of being a spiritual dad too to the, to the church. And I can tell you it's, it's a really blessing to have spiritual dads and mums um, because... We, 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 even Ross and I at our age, we're so blessed to have those that walk in the faith and share with us and guide us into all truth. So, yeah, we're all done. Yep. So thank you. And I will welcome Gary first. Thank you. Thank you. So let's pray for our kids. It's like the right of reply. I get to pray now. And well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, mighty God, we thank you so much for our kids. We thank you for who they are and who they're going to be and who they are not just uh, uh, to us, but who they are to you. We thank you that you love our kids so much. And as uh, the teachers and the kids get to have a whole bunch of fun together, pray that they would uh, be able to encourage one another, the teachers encouraging the, the, the children and the children encouraging the teachers. And uh, mighty God, as they uh, go, bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I have um, a couple of questions to address this morning, and funnily enough, um, whilst there's three questions, I kind of only have two points in my lovely little part of this message, um, but it does cover all three of the, uh, the lovely little topics or questions that um, 
Daryl gave us to, to share on this morning. And, um, and it was already on my heart before I even had the, the questions from Daryl. Uh, so isn't the Holy Spirit wonderful? Um, he's just so great. And what I might do is I might just start back at the beginning and then we'll move through to the end. So, sounds fair, right? Well, I was born at a very young age and I had two parents and one of them was my dad. None of that is a surprise so far, I'm sure. But the key thing is that my dad knew my heavenly dad since before I was born. And there's something about having a dad in the natural who has uh, that, that knowledge, that, that relationship with God, the 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 spiritual dad as well as the natural dad and he didn't just teach me about life he taught me about god now in our, in our family um my my mother was the the social butterfly and my dad was much much quieter and so um in terms of growing up, um, a, a lot of my, my memories and relating to my parents was more, more my mum than my dad. But I'm not sure that she really had more... It, whilst there's a lot more memories, I'm not sure that she had more influence because when my dad had input into my life, um, it was solid gold and it meant so much. And... The, the one word, one word that I would use to describe my dad is solid. Now, it's not because he's sort of short and well-built and can't push him over if you tried, sort of solid. It's that uh, when he spoke, it had huge meaning. Um, he might not have uh, given as many words as my mum, but they were always solid gold. And he was there and he, he enabled and, and built and um, was a foundation that our family was able to function and, and build upon. And one of the, the best parts uh, about growing up uh, with my dad um, was that he was passionate about things. And um, whilst he... People find it really, really hard to read my dad. He's got a huge, big, bushy beard. I don't know whether that helps disguise his true intentions or whatnot. But um, people see him as a big, scary bear, when in reality, he's more like a teddy bear. Um, and it's absolutely hilarious to watch um, uh, because people get almost intimidated by him when he's just being perfectly nice and reasonable because they can't read him and they don't know that his eyes are smiling when he's um, talking to them. Um, but he gave me a lot of really good advice um, when I was growing up. And in the good times and in the bad times, um, his advice was always solid. Um, and I didn't always want to hear it um, at the time. Um, but he really helped train me into who I am. He's a lot more practical than I am. That was one of his main frustrations. Um, I'd prefer to um, convince, bribe, or whatever someone else to you know bang a nail in or do something practical than have to do it myself because I'm just not very good at those sorts of things. Um, but he trained me anyway, and so I ca I can do the practical things because my dad persisted um, with frustration and all those other things. Um, but it was really good. So I've got a solid dad and that's such a blessing now because I'm now a dad and I had no idea that becoming a dad would... Uh, changed me so much and 
I mean, I expected certain things, but um, I, I had no idea, really, um, before I became a dad, exactly what it was going to be like. And one of the blessings now is that I still have a solid dad, and he's a solid grandfather too. Um, and, and the impact that he has on, on my kids is solid gold. And in fact, I would say that my dad is an even better parent now than he was when I was growing up, purely because he's learned a lot of things and he continues to be teachable and learn in his life along the way. And I want to be like that too. The biggest thing that I've learned about being a dad uh, or from being a dad is it's really, really good to have uh, enough humility to be teachable. Um, and indeed, your kids can teach you so much or enable you to grow in so many ways if you have the right attitude and if you want to grow. <laughs> there's opportunities every day. And um, so we, my, my wife and I, we grew the Searle team and we have four beautiful children, and I have a solid dad, and we have a great team. And so, uh, it was, it's one of the things that when I, when I reflect and I look back, that when I started out, when we started out growing the Searle team, uh, I had expectation that we would have lots of team members and it would be, uh, you know, heavily reliant on me. And yes, it, it kind of is. But at the same time, um, when, when we build team, uh, the children bring so much to the table. Um, and it's not just about uh, my ability to influence them. Uh, it's about uh, raising them to be able to influence others and allowing them to influence our cell family team as well. Um, one of the um, most uh, beautiful things that we've learnt as we've become parents is that we're not actually raising children. We're raising responsible adults. Um, and we've got the, the goal in mind that, well, no, we, we're, we're not making kids. Uh, we are releasing incredible adults into the world after, and, and helping them and training them and enabling them to train each other. Um, it's amazing um, how some of my parenting skills rub off on my kids and they, they help each other. Sometimes they shouldn't parent each other and they're learning what boundaries are as well. But it's so cool that we can grow the team. And it's so cool that we have team here at Abundant Life. If you're not part of a life group, get into one. You meet a whole bunch of really cool mothers and fathers. And we build team because... The best way to do life is with team or with family. And we have that here. We have spiritual mums, we have spiritual dads. And the, the most amazing part of being part of uh, the family of God is just that. That we can be teachable and we can influence others and we can allow others to influence us. It, it makes us a little bit vulnerable and you do have to be a little bit careful who you trust. But let me encourage you that if you want that relationship, there are others here at Abundant Life who want that too. And that ability to, to connect, to minister one to another, is, is what will help us uh, to grow. And when 
we have our explosion and, and lots of people are coming in through our doors and we're <clears throat> talking to the whosoevers in our community and, and people are coming to know who Jesus is. Um, that's what's going to build our community and allow us to, to be ones who can disciple others and be discipled ourselves. Um, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's around mentoring. So whether you're a, a dad in the natural or even whether you're a dad in the spiritual, you might not have personally led someone to Christ. But let me assure you that if you're living for Christ, you are a part of the witness. It's not one person who will lead someone to Christ. It, it's a community and it's the Holy Spirit who does the work. And don't, don't minimise your part or your influence on others. Um, acknowledge that um, we can all be a blessing and an influence and help others around us to grow. And so I'm going to hand over to Chris on that thought. Solid fathers, building team, building family. I'm on off the tissue box because this is like the hardest request anybody has ever made of me. Ooh. It's raw. And as I wrestled with this this week, because um, um, Pastor Darrell's asked someone who loves preaching to do eight minutes. That's really hard, number one. And number two, he's asked me to talk about my dad that passed away six years ago. Number two. So I rang him this week and I said, how about we just do a panel, you know? I could do a panel. Let's do a Q and A. I can do Q and A, right? I'm good at Q and A. I can do Q and A. I'll host it even, you know, it'd be great. He went, no. I went, oh, okay, right. Ooh. My wife said, if you can't do it, just tell him you can't. But I really felt that uh, I needed to share about some things this morning, and I hope it helps someone, or a few of you, anyway. So the first question was, what influence did your father have in your life? Now, there's a poem that's doing the rounds on Facebook. It makes me cry every time, which is why I'm ironing off the tissue box. But I want to read this to you. Now, it's not actually attributed to the Facebook mean. It's actually attributed to Bob Perks. And if you've heard this poem before, it's really good. And it probably epitomizes my dad. I wish you enough sun to keep your attitude bright no matter how grey the day may appear. I wish you enough rain to appreciate the sun even more. I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive. See, there it goes. Whew. Um, and everlasting. I wish you enough pain so that you even the smallest joys in life may appear bigger. I wish you enough gain to satisfy your wanting. I wish you enough loss to appreciate that all you possess. I wish you enough hellos to get through the final goodbye, which was six years ago for me. A really hard time in my wife and I's life because, and I'll just take a second, we didn't just lose my dad. We actually miscarried a child at the same time. Real stuff, right? Real people. Real stuff. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But my dad was all about wishing me enough. He showed me and taught me a lot of stuff. And like Gary said, sometimes it wasn't verbal. Sometimes it was just watching. And what dads do well, and I hope I do this well, is to be a strength and an example. And you don't know who's watching. You don't know who's watching you every single day when you get up, you brush your teeth, you brush your hair, you put your clothes on for work, you put your shoes on. You don't know who's watching. My daughter says to my, my wife the other day, Mommy, I've decided what I want to be in life. And I hope that she doesn't pursue this just quietly. She says, I want to be a school principal. And I said, okay. <laughs> my wife says to Joanna, and they're both sick today, so that's why they're not here. Um, my wife says to Joanna, why is that, darling? Because that's what daddy does, and I want to be just like him. Yeah. You don't know who's watching. You really do not know who's watching. Now, I haven't said that. I've actually said to my daughter, you want to be a doctor and make lots of money, right? That's what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I follow that up with, because one day you've got to look after me, <laughs> and I want to live pretty well in retirement. But anyway... Uh, we have this little joke, and you know what? As a dad, I, I just want the best for my kids, and that's what my dad wanted. He was strong, and his strength brought security. 
He taught me about giving back. He taught me that no job is ever beneath you. No job ever. He taught, he taught me the value of hard work. He actually taught me that money does, in fact, grow on trees because we were mango farmers. Um, but no, hard work. My dad worked a full-time job. He worked a farm, and he loaded railway sleepers on the weekend. Now, the reason he did that, though he never actually verbally said this, was because his aim in life was to put four of his kids, he had four kids on the third, through university. Because he wished us enough. He wished us enough. Whatever we wanted to do, he wanted to be able to enable that. He wished us enough. He worked his backside off so that I didn't have to. And my siblings... And he's, he actually, I actually wanted a part-time job in high school. I said, I want to work at BP Servo. It's still BP Servo, actually, when I was a kid. I wanted a part-time job because I wanted some stuff. You know what my dad said to me? He said, you have a full-time job. And I'm like, oh, yeah? It's news to me. <laughs> he said, your job is to do good in school so that one day you don't have to do what I do. And he said, no to the job. No job. You know, we worked on the farm as kids. We never got paid, all that stuff, you know. The value of hard work, all of that. He taught me all of that stuff, which I took into my schooling, into my university, into all of that. Hard work pays off because he came to my graduation in 2002 and then I did a second degree because I'm silly enough to do that in 2004. Um, and I'm sure as he stood there, although he didn't say this, he thought... That was worth it. He showed me that. So now, <laughs> i got to live up to that, right? Now that you know something, you've got to actually put it into practice with your own kids. But instead of just crying and being a fumbling, bumbling mess, I thought, you, I thought I'd share with you two sayings he had in life. Is that okay? Because these are imprinted probably physically on my backside and a couple, <laughs> a couple on my forehead. Um, no, he didn't hit me on the forehead, but they're actually in my brain. And he says this, there's two sayings that I'll never, ever forget. And I live by these. It's probably kind of three. Um, he says, well, he said, you work when the work is there and you play when it's not. Typical farmer, right? But it was the same principle when I was finding it hard in my university studies. You work when the work's there and you play when it's not. Good life principle there. And number two, he said this, and this is for a bit of a laugh. He said, there's only one good type of fight in this world. And that's one you're not in. So, at the same time, he taught me how to fight. My dad wanted me to be able to defend myself. And I'm not here to say that I'm a violent person, and I think those that know me, I'm not a violent person. But he showed me how to fight and how to defend myself. And uh, I've got to tell you a little secret. That nearly came in handy uh, last week in Brisbane because my dad always said, you stand up for the little guy, right? Because I'm a big guy, right? Big guy. And he said, you don't walk past it because the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And two things happened to me in Brisbane last week. My mate, who's only tiny, he's skinny, got a box of chips thrown at him at the Red Cliff Cowboys game, right? And I looked at him and I said, are you okay? And he goes, Ugh. So I turned around and I went, you right, mate? Because, you know, you look out for the little guy. Anyway, the old mate behind me shrunk in his chair, which is fair enough. And then the next night, it's a true story, and I'm not trying to big note myself. I'm in the middle of Queen Street Mall. I was down there for work, by the way. And this guy's getting chased. And Johnny's at the back. He'd know about Queen Street Mall. This guy's getting chased. He gets pinned against the wall. And my dad's voice is in my head. You don't walk past it. So I stood there. I was with someone else, and I'm like, man, is this guy going to back me if I'm in here, right? Because you just do an assessment. It's called the risk matrix, right? Every guy probably does it. I could take him, take him. Oh, I don't know about that one. All right. What am I going to do? Where's the risk assessment matrix? And the guy I'm with, he's not in like me. He's walking past it. And I'm like, can't walk past it. So just me stopping and actually going, i got to help this dude. The other guy froze because all of a sudden he thought, no one's walking past this anymore. And the guy stopped. And the guy pinned against the wall was able to get away. No, I'm not saying the guy pinned against the wall was innocent. I don't know the story. But I won't stand there and watch some dude beat into some guy, hold him against a wall. I can't walk past that. Because these are principles that my, my dad, my earthly dad, has put into me. Fast forwarding then to how did fatherhood change your life? 
there's no manual. Man, they need to give out licenses for this thing, right? This is hard. <laughs> How did it change my life? Well, this is a tough question because I've lived both sides of this coin. Tissues at the ready. Like I shared before, my wife and I found it hard to have children. My wife and I had two little miracles. And we did 10 rounds of IVF to get those two little miracles. So I'm busted broke. Just kidding. No, God provides. Um, but I've also lived the pain of both sides of that coin. So how's it changed my life? Well, I'm going to tell you what their names are. Their names are Joanna, which means God is gracious. And my boy's name's Zachariah, which means God has remembered. That's how it's changed my life. It says to me, every time I say their name and I speak it out, I say, my God is gracious. He is able to deliver for me. And I'm sorry if that's harder for you in certain things, but I've lived this coin, right? My God is gracious. And when I look at my son and I say, Zachariah, I say, God has remembered me in my struggle. He has remembered me. We have two miracles, and every time I look at them, I think about how that journey... God has shown himself to be faithful and true, and God has shown himself to be one who remembers. You know, we sang that song today, Waymaker, and it says, even when I don't know that you're working, I know that you're working. Even when I don't feel it. Who's ever been there where they don't feel it? Yeah? I reckon if we're honest with ourselves, that's probably 95% of the time. You know, we don't stand on the mountaintop every single day. I told you this would be very real. You were like, you're supposed to be preaching all this stuff. No, it's very real and I hope it helps you. 95% of the time, we're not on the mountain. We're either on the way up the mountain or we're on the way down on the other side, right? 95% of the time, we're not feeling it, but we know it because it's in here. When I, when I call my children's name, it's in here. It's in the pain. It's in the sacrifice. It's in the journey. So how has it changed me? It's hard. It's seriously tough. It's given me a greater understanding of sacrifice, I guess, and putting others before myself. The dads in the room, you probably can uh, attest to this, but every single day you don't wake up thinking, what can I do for myself today? You think, oh man, what's before me today? All right, I've got to get that kid there. I've got to do that. I've got to do that. I've got to make sure my wife's doing okay because, man, they do a hard job. And today, Jill's at home with two sick kids. So you're thinking, man, I've got to juggle work. I've got to juggle this. And you live a life of sacrifice every single day. And wives on Father's Day, because it'd be the only day of the year I'm allowed to say that without getting knived in the back. If I can encourage you to do one thing for your husbands today, and that's honour the sacrifice. That's all they want to know. Husbands and fathers just want to know that they're seen. They don't need the pat on the back. They don't need a new fishing rod. They don't need a new boat, although, Jill, if you're watching, no. <laughs> they bring out another thousand, yeah. They just want to be seen. Okay, if I can encourage you, sons, daughters, wives, dads just want to be seen. They just want you to honour the sacrifice because it's hard at times to get up and keep doing the same thing every single day, sometimes seven days a week. And they just want to know that you know that it's hard. They don't need stuff. In fact, dads don't even like stuff. My wife, she like gets me things and I go, I don't need that. Most blokes are really practical, practical guys, right? We're just like... I just want a shirt, probably maybe two, so that I can wash one and have a clean one. A pair of pants, although washing those are optional. And some shoes, right? We're pretty simple creatures. I'm just very real today. Very real today, right? Very honest. But we just want to be seen. All right, honour the sacrifice that they made. You know, the things I've learned along the way, I've become adept at holding stuff in both hands while holding kids. That's a pretty big learning for me because... I'm pretty dominant on my right-hand side. I've got to tell you, my left foot, man, I can catch something falling to the ground real quick. Um, my left hand's now real quick too, so that's pretty cool. I've learned how to deal with my uh, aversion to strong smells, vomit and poo. Um, that's pretty good, I guess. It was tested this morning, I've got to say. Um, man, my kid's been sick. Definitely a bit more ambidextrous. I've enjoyed long car, ride, car rides and flights and even longer nights. But it's worth the sacrifice. I'm also adept at first aid. I didn't know this about myself until I had to put it into action. I tell you what, I'll never forget the nurse when I arrived at the hospital with my daughter who's got a cut above her hairline and it's covered by her hair, thank goodness. She fell out of the cot. Dad of the year moment, right? I'm on supervision duty. Many questions were asked. It's okay. We've lived through this. Head first into the bottom window sill 
edge, proper cut. My wife's in our pool because I'm on supervision duty and I should be a capable adult, right? Anyway, you can't control kids sometimes. They just do things randomly really quick. Head first into the thing. No noise, no crying, no screaming. I thought she was dead. First aid kicks in real fast. Now, I'm trained, right? I've worked in schools. I'm proper first aid trained, still current. I've gone... I won't use the word I used. Um, you can think of one. Um, and I went, crap. Right. Excellent. Picked her up. She's, this is like three years ago, by the way. Maybe a little bit less. Picked her up. Blood on my shirt, because I can't find where the blood's coming from, right? Because I didn't actually see it happen. Johnny, this is all ahead of you if it hasn't happened yet, mate. Good luck. Take a piece of this. I'm looking for the blood. I'm screaming for my wife. My wife doesn't know what's going on. And I just go into proper first aid mode. I'm like, I need a towel, I need ice, and I need the car keys. And my wife's like, what's happened? I said, don't worry about it, just do those three things and we'll be fine. <laughs> if you didn't know first aid, pressure with the towel, ice slows bleeding, and car keys to get her to, the ambul get her to the hospital because I knew on my way home from work that day that the ambulance were already attending a car accident. So it was me, right? My wife's like, we won't be able to get into a car seat. I said, I don't care if the cops pull me over, I'll say, this is what's going on, get me there and we'll get there faster, right? So I was pretty good at first aid, got to the hospital, triage nurse was like, what's happened? I said, two-year-old girl, found from a height of one and a half metres, three to five centimetre gash on her forehead, bleeding, bleeding stopped, go. And they're like, you know what you're doing? I said, yeah, I've been here before, yo. Anyway, I'm very adept at first aid. Um, and I know my way around hospitals. <laughs> I know the system. Dads out there with young kids or people who have got kids who have grown up, you probably can attest to this. It's all true, right? Yeah, we all been there. It's not just me. I sometimes think I'm on like a child safety watch list, yeah? When I go to the hospital, I'm like, they're like, you again. I'm like, yeah, me again. And I say to Jill, maybe you should go next time. But anyway, um, it's all good. I've learned the funny, right? But real. I told you to be real. And the third question this morning is how valuable or how important are fathers of the faith in our church? And my first dot point was hugely important. I return to what I said before. You never know who's watching. You know, I'm a sports person, and I remember when I was 15 years old, and Pat Rafter, I don't know who Pat Rafter is in this room. I hope I'm talking to the right people. Yeah, he was like Australia's answer to be the next big thing on the tennis court. I'm playing the under-15 state champions tennis in Brisbane at the Milton Tennis Centre, which no longer exists, and Pat Rafter turns up. And I'm like, stop what you're doing, and let's just go watch what this guy does. Now, it's not because I'm in, like, hero mode. In fact, I didn't even want to get his autograph. But you know what I wanted? I wanted to see what he did to get that good. I wanted to watch. Pat Rafter didn't know I was watching. I wasn't very noisy. I wasn't the groupie that wanted the autograph and the poster. I wanted to see the little things that he did so that I could be better. In our church, men who are spiritual dads, you never know who's watching. It's probably part of the reason I'm standing up here today sharing some raw emotion with you in the hope that you actually learn something from it because you never know who's watching, who's listening, and who's actually trying to glean from you. Spiritual dads, they know how to fight the battles that you may not. They've probably been there before. I joke about dads in the room. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there before, right? There's no manual on this thing, right? You learn something new every day. This morning, I learned that a chicken can survive with its head being pulled by a one-year-old. I was surprised at that. If you were there, you'd know what I'm talking about, right? I've gone, wow, that chicken's still alive. Awesome. I'm also thinking if that chicken had died, I'd have to deal with the four-year-old who owns the chicken, and then I may have to buy a replacement, and then it'd never be the same. My strongest dad advice, if your kid ever has a favorite toy, buy two of them. Okay, that's my strongest dad tip of the day. If you're father the bee or your young dad and your kid's got a favorite toy, buy two of them, maybe three, because if one goes missing, it's on for young and old. But spiritual dads, they know how to fight. They provide strength and security. I remember when my dad was around, he didn't have to say anything, but all of a sudden, I felt like it was going to be okay. There's a strength and a security in spiritual dads in church. Whenever there's a dad around, you kind of feel like it's going to be okay. They don't have to say anything, and they actually don't have to do anything. But because of who they are and because of the battles they won, you're kind of going to go, we're going to be okay. Imagine for yourself that David from the Bible walked into this church service this morning. I think we're all going to go, I think we're going to be all right. 
Yeah? Because there's strength in, in dads and spiritual dads when they're just around. He wouldn't have to say anything. He wouldn't have to do anything. But we would know in his presence there's security. Kind of like our Father in heaven, right? In his presence there's security, there's life. Yeah? They guide and direct and they provide emotional security and oversight. How I see fathers and fatherhood is we all need to try and reflect the values in and point people towards Father God. And if you've got a Bible this morning, because I thought I'd better throw a scripture in there because, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I get paid for, right? Oh, hang on. I don't get paid for that. No, just kidding. <laughs> this is voluntold, right? Yeah, no, just kidding. So Psalm 91, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He doesn't have to do anything, but because he's there, you're going to find your rest. There's a whole lot more in Psalm 91, but I'll run out of time. I encourage you later to go and read about this and, and have a look at Psalm 91 and see if you see the similarities in what are some of the things I just shared this morning and how our fathers naturally and spiritually provide security. And I'm handing it over to Pastor David. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Hey, thank you, Chris. That was an exciting, interesting thing to know about you. <laughs> well, my, 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 my story about my dad, it's a bit different. Uh, my dad passed away in 1975. That's a long time ago. And uh, I haven't seen my dad for a few years. We moved to another town from Rabaul, and then we went to the games. My brother and I represent Papua New Guinea in weightlifting. We went to Guam, and when we came back, we heard that pass away. So we have to catch a plane straight away, go back to, went back to Rabaul, and uh, prepare the funeral there. <clears throat> what I like about my dad was that when he was alive, we had two, nine children, so I'm, I'm the second. And then after that, seven more. And in those times, we helped to look after the kids, you know. My dad was, uh, during the war, Second World War, we lived out of Rabaul, about 20, 20 kilometers out in another village, where the Chinese folks were there in, t in the intern. And dad was working there, I suppose, as a carpenter. And then one day, dad was shot in a friendly fire. And shot his legs. And he suffered, a long, suffered for a long time. A long time, he was out of action, suffering. And then when we moved to Rabaul, I was maybe only a baby. I'm, I don't know. I didn't know. I just heard of this story afterwards, you know. And we went by Rabao, and then Dad didn't sort of give up and say, well, I am disabled. I'm going to sit around and say, I, I'm not going to do anything, you know, and have a pity party. No. My dad picked pick himself up. Had an artificial leg, you know. In those days, artificial leg is heavy. It's not like now; it's just one stick, and you can run a hundred meters. You know, in those days, you can't run; you just walk. So he got that. He was a carpenter, but he cannot do any more carpentry work. So he formed a company with five other elders of the of. I nearly said elders of the church, elders, of, <laughs> elders of, the, of, the, of the community. And they called, called themselves UBC, United Builders Company. And then my dad became the general managing director of that company. And he was in the office all the time, directing traffic, doing everything. And he used to get contract tender. He put in tender and he always win because he's quite smart, you know. I, I remember going to the office, he got a dictionary, Chinese and English dictionary, you know. He always look, looked it up and find the answer for everything. And so he always win tenders, you know, for the high school, hospital, 
uh, agriculture college, that one or the tender, and he employed, they employed 300 people, at least, at least 300 people. And they got the biggest company in Rabao. And they were do, so successful doing things, you know. And I remember Dad was the, he's a board member for the Rabao High School. And afterwards, when he retired, he asked me to become a board member. And so I have to attend to some of those meetings, very boring, you know, with the education department. To me, anyway, they're boring, you know. They talk about things I didn't understand. Anyway, what, what I did was, a, he, he, he was a, like a sportman, you know, but he can't play sport, but he still like playing tennis, like not as good as Chris, you know. <laughs> he, he still like tennis, so one day, when, I remember when I was about 10 or 12 years old, he said, come on, David, and my, my younger brother, let's come. We, I, I'm going to play tennis. I need you to help. Okay, so we ran along, and you know what we did? We were ball boys, you know. He just stood around in the middle and hit the ball, and, and we got to pick up the ball and give it back to him, and he played. Played for one hour. We just run around. By the time we finished, we were tired, and he wasn't tired. He just hit the ball. <laughs> but anyway, he liked, he liked sport, you know. He liked sports, so he, he encouraged us to play sport. And every time when we play tennis competition, I look up, and there he was in the car watching us play. More or less, that's an encouragement. When your father comes to watch you te play tennis or play sport, you are being encouraged that dad is interested in you. Yeah. So what I, what I get, got from, you know, from years, I found out about my dad. I found out that he became a Christian, but I didn't know about it. He had a friend. He had a friend always come to see him and witness to him. So I believe he became a Christian, and, and we see him in heaven one day. And so, so what happened is that I, I always pick up things from dad. We always learn, you know, the Bible said, be imitators of God. So we imitate the dad some, a lot. So we, we, uh, I pick up, pick up a lot of things that are, are good from him. And four things I last want to share with you, what, what I pick up from my father. Number one is, uh, hang on, number one is, now hang on, let's go for this, uh, honesty. Honesty is the one thing that I always like to be honest. You deal with business, with people, always honest. Never, never lie, never do anything underhand, you know, always up front. And then the second one is, uh, a Gener uh, generous spirit. You have a generous spirit. You always, always help people, always do things. And in New Year's Day, you should see our house. You know, we all get over 100 people come to our house and enjoy the food mom cook and then all the drinks they had, you know, because we celebrate New Year with the lion dance. Yeah. And then the, uh, then the other one is uh, honor. Honor is very important because he said, you must honor your word. Everything you say, you do, you must follow it up. Never, never, never don't undo what you said. In the old days, a handshake, you know, is a contract, isn't it? You don't need to sign anything. So dad always say, when you say you do something, make sure you follow up. Otherwise, people will not trust you anymore. They don't trust you. And then, and then the other one is uh, respect. I learned that from boarding school, but I also learned that from my father. Respect. You must respect your elders. You must respect uh, the law. You must respect authority. And, and respect is so important. You know? If you don't respect people, you must respect people. If you don't respect people, people won't respect you. So it's a, it's a give and take. So these four things I learned from my, my dad. And I always do that. I follow that all the time. And whatever I do, I do that. So that, that's, the, that's the four things I learned from my father. The second thing is that uh, Elizabeth and I, we didn't have any children. So we still enjoy life. We still be fruitful in doing the things that God wants us to do. Just because we didn't have any children, we stop. No, we keep going. We do things. You know, one good thing about it, we got a lot of family. 
with kids, and he said, uh, uh, Uncle David, would you like to look after Sarah? Oh, no problem. Bring, bring up, you know, bring at six, uh, seven o'clock, and we will come and pick it up. So we don't have to look after it afterwards, you know. If you just look after during the day, and then hey, you take it back now, you go, you know. <laughs> so, so that's one good thing about it. We we do that all the time. They come and said, uh, Uncle David, get, are you free? Yeah, just bring them in, and we look after. You can pick it up again <laughs> after you finish work. This is my, my niece. She's a school teacher. <laughs> she always uh, asks us. So we don't mind, you know, we help. But those, those, those are men who are unable to be fathers. I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you today. Don't give up just because of that. You know, just, just be fruitful and do what God has planned for you. All right? And be, enjoy what you are doing. Because God loves you and He continues to, to lead you. Because if you're born again, Jesus is living in you and the Holy Spirit is in you. So the Holy Spirit is your comforter. He is leading you all the time, guiding you, directing you and helping you. But also, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know why? Because Jesus lives in you. You can't get away from Jesus. Everywhere you go, you carry Jesus. All right? That's why he said, I will never leave you and forsake you. Every time when you think you get away from God, no, you can't. You do something wrong, you scratch your tummy and say, eh, eh, don't do it. So he said, I will never leave you and forsake you. I'm going to bring you back to where you're supposed to be. Yeah. So, so that, uh, the, the last one about the uh, the father of the house, the uh, father of the faith in the house, okay? I just want to share one testimony about when I was in Brisbane, I encountered a family, a family that I can see, and they, they sort of, uh, I embrace them because I see that he is the, fam- he's the faith in that family with his family, and he's a Cook Islander, all right? A Cook Islander? He, I, I met him, I become friends in the old church I used to go to, and he got a lot of kids. And then I can see that he trained his children up the way they should do according to the Bible. All the children were brought up nicely. They respect people, and they honor people. And then I said, one day I, I said to him, no, he, he's good. He always come and bless me with things, you know. Even though, even though he, uh, he finished work, he come and said, Hey, Pastor David, here, I'll give you some money. He said, Don't give me money. I got money. No, 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 I want to bless you. So I didn't stop him from the blessing. If I stop him, if I didn't receive the blessing of, of, of the money, then he cannot be blessed. So that's why I said, All right, give it to me. Thank you. I pray over it. And guess what? He continued to be blessed in his job, you know. He come and tell me, Hey, they promoted me, you know. Oh, that's good. That's good, you know. That's the blessing. So one day I said to him, his name is Terry. I said, Terry, could you help me? Five years before I came up to uh, Mariba, I volunteered to be, a, <laughs> to be a, what do you call it, a car park attendant at the conference every year, once a year in, in the old church. We get about 500 people for the conference, and you have to find car park for 200 cars, you know? There's a lot of car park. So I said, okay. What we I do? So I rang Terry. Terry, come. I need your help. You got anybody that you know that come and help me do a car park? No problem. <laughs> when is the conference? I, I gave him a date. And then I waited in the morning. You know what? He sent his children, aged from, age from 10 to 14. He sent about four or five of them. I, I scratched my head. I said, do you think they're okay to look after the car park? <laughs> they're so young. And I, and I said, okay. So I, got, I gave them a vest. I gave them some instruction, what to do, what to do. And then at night, they come at night, I give them a torch and give them a yellow and orange vest so, so people can see them. So that's good. I show them how to, how to do all the car park. And they did it. Over 200 cars, you know, the car park was full. And so Terry and I just sit in the chair in the entrance 
and then they come every now and then they come back and report to us. Everything okay? Okay. Every 15 minutes, you go walk around and make sure you security, you know, security, look after all the cars. And they did, you know. They were very obedient, the boys, and they did well. But now I think they're about 19, 20, 20 years now. They're old, old, older now, and, and they continue, I, I believe they continue to serve the Lord, right? Eh? All the time. And so one time, you know, uh, Terry said, hey, come, come to my house. I want you to share with my family and share with my children. I said, okay, I come. And when I got there, you know how many people there? 30 or 40. All the, all the, all the family and all the children. So I, I share the word of God and I share there. And then I, I, he said, Pastor David, I want you to pray for all my children. All the children here. It's about maybe 15 to 20 children. So, okay, come. So I pray for them, you know. See, that, that's a household, household of faith, you know, I can see in action. That's why I, I connect with him and I encourage him all the time. So that's the testimony of this family. And I, I haven't seen him for a while. He's gone back to Cook Island to build his house. So one day I might meet, him, meet up with him again, you know. So, you know, it, the, to be the, 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 all the father of faith, you know, in the past, they have imparted wisdom to us. And we got hold of the wisdom. And now we, we, the father of faith in this house, has embraced the wisdom that the older, older faith people that imparted to us. So I want to encourage you today, you grab hold of it. Every one of you are become a spiritual parent, you know. You are to look after, look after those young ones, impart wisdom to the younger generation, and impart wisdom to those who are new, born-again Christian and encourage them. Everybody can do it. And then you become a spiritual father or spiritual mother to them. And encourage them to do it. You know, do it. Everybody can do it. Because once you start doing that, God will expand, expand you, you know. You know, in John, in John Gospel, Jesus said, I only do the things that the Father asked me to do. And then he said, I only say the things that the Father asked me to say. So I want to impart on you today. You can say, I only do the things that God wants me to do according to the word of God. And I only say the things that God asked me to say according to the word of God. I, cannot, I will not say anything negative. I will only say things that are positive to encourage, for encouragement. No negative things. Okay? No negative things. Just positive things. So in the name of Jesus, thank you. Amen. Uh, hey, Good morning, everyone. Uh, just acknowledge those online too. Uh, happy Father's Day to everyone. Uh, watching online, all those fathers, or to-be fathers, or grandfathers. Uh, happy Father's Day. Okay, what a influence, uh, and I'm aware of the time, so uh, it, it, I'll try and keep it fairly short. Okay. What influence did my father have in my life? He had a big influence in my life. I spent the, my early years on a dairy farm, and uh, that, that was a good experience for me. But my dad taught me a lot of things, not necessarily by speaking words, as Chris said, but by example. The old saying that some things are caught and not taught. Uh, my dad was very practical. And for me as a kid, it seemed to me like my dad could just fix everything. Uh, and some of those traits have uh, been passed on to me as uh, I'm very practical as well. Uh, when we were travelling as a family, our family, um, in PNG, uh, we were travelling between Leigh and Ukarampa where our kids were at boarding school. And um, uh, it was about a 45 minute drive, uh, sorry, no, about a three hour drive uh, up to um, Ukarampa. And we had this little two cylinder Subaru. And uh, we had our two younger children 
uh, with us and uh, our two older children were up in uh, at the boarding school and we had some uh, children of someone else's family with us as well. Well about 45 minutes out of Lay, the engine died on, on our car. It, we just happened to be passing a uh, old abandoned airstrip, the old wartime airstrip that's up there. Um, so I pulled off the road as the engine stopped and it was right on the airstrip. And um, I remembered a story that I was told about my dad. Um, they said that he once um, got the leaf of a tree and uh, shaped it and put it in the, uh, a fuel pump as a valve to uh, get him home. So he was very practical. And I made the remark to Jeanette, well, if my dad can do that, I'm sure I can do something with our car. So I walked up, off up the airstrip. Uh, there was a few old wrecks up there. And uh, I brought back some junk and a piece of wire and fabricated. It was uh, the points that had collapsed. I fabricated a little thing and put it in um, the uh, distributor and the car went. Now, I wasn't sure how long it was going to go for because it wasn't a good thing to break down in PNG because uh, a lot of things could happen. And uh, so we got the car going. I drove it back to Lay and I had another set of points at home and put those in and I can't remember whether we went uh, that afternoon or the next morning up to um, Ugarumpa to see the kids. But Dad taught me a lot of things. I always knew that he was serious about his commitment to his faith in Jesus. He spent hours in his study reading and praying. Uh, my older brother, t uh, not Bert, I oh, know Bert wouldn't do this. Um, <laughs> He told us a story just recently of, because um, uh, here uh, my oldest brother had to get up uh, every morning before school and go and work in the dairy and do stuff in the dairy, um, something that we didn't get the privilege of doing because uh, we were, you know, the kids. But um, it, occasionally my brother, uh, Les, would um, be lying in bed and if he ever heard Dad coming down the, uh, the corridor, he said, I'd spring out of bed and get on my knees so that my dad thought I was praying. And he, said, he, he, he never wanted to interrupt me praying. <laughs> we always had Bible devotions and prayer after the evening meal. My dad taught me about commitment. He taught me about helping others. He was the Mr. Fix-It uh, among all the rallies so, uh, who uh, had dairy farms around the area. So he was off, often fixing everyone else's problems, which was often a sacrifice his own family endured. I always knew that my father loved me and uh, I trusted him. But like all dads, I know he was not perfect. And as I look back over my life, Especially as I became a father and, and took on that role, I see traits that were in his life that uh, became part of my life. My dad died of a heart attack at the age of 61 when I was 10 years old. So I didn't really have a father's guidance and instruction through my teen years and my young adult years. I guess I gave my mum a, a lot of grief uh, during that period as I got up to mischief uh, 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 during that time. Becoming a father myself was a, a big learning curve. I always had this sense that these children, that these children's lives were precious. And I loved my family. I loved them deeply. But, as Chris said, um, I missed the lectures on how to bring up kids uh, there wasn't any in those days. And it was mainly learn from your mistakes. And I know that we made many. One of the things that was ingrained in me and which had come from my father as well uh, and was also part of the era was that the father's responsibility was to provide, provide for his family. And so I spent long hours at work, often from daylight to dark, uh, providing for my family which in some instances meant that I wasn't spending the time that I probably should have with them. 
We sometimes think that it would be great to be able to go back and do it all again. But that's water under the bridge. Although my dad was not there during my teen and young adult uh, life, uh, there were men who influenced my life. There were those who were like spiritual fathers to me and I, I appreciate uh, what they put into my life. I appreciate that they were part of my life. They were an important part of my life. The truth is I still need spiritual fathers in my life and we all need spiritual fathers in, in our lives. People who will influence us uh, a godly man who has the freedom uh, to be honest with us and tell us when, when they can see something happen in, happening in the, our lives, to, to be honest with us and talk to us and, um, and challenge us about what's happening and to ask questions. You know, there were those who influenced me to do things that were not good for me. There were those who hurt me and wounded me. And although I didn't know it at the time, that had an ongoing effect in my life. And I've had to work through a process of forgiveness so that I can be free of the power of this unforgiveness. Jesus said in... I've got to have one verse too, um, Chris. Yeah. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. And that is who the devil is. A thief who wants, wants to see us wallow in our unforgiveness and hold on to wounds and let, let them fester in our lives and have them keep affecting our lives. The truth is that we need healing and freedom from those things. We need to be free to live the life that God wants for us and to ful fulfill the purpose that he has created us each one for. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. God wants to be our father. He wants us to walk in relationship with him. Jesus wants us to, to take the life he offers and walk with him. You know, as a kid, one day I was... Um, walking home from school. I'm not sure whether Bert must have been there. I don't, I don't recall. But um, anyway, we were walking home from school and this car that I'd never seen before pulled up and this guy was struggling to get out of the car. And, you know, for a little while I, was, I, I had a bit of a fear. What was happening? Was I going to be abducted and, and, and taken off? Uh, but then, oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, that was my dad. And it, it, the reason why he was all contorted was it was a new car and... He didn't know how to open the door to get out. <laughs> and, uh, I thought he was trying to get out in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe there's father figures in your life that have not been a good influence for you. Maybe they've damaged your view of what a father is like. And maybe just like me, you are having trouble recognising God is your father. You know, when something's happening in your life and you're not understanding what's going on, uh, maybe you're struggling with recognising God as your father. Jesus wants to be part of your life. He wants to walk with you in restoring and healing the hurts that are keeping you from fully living the life that God has for you. You know, if, if that's you, um, talk to someone about it. Talk to a trusted friend about it because there is help. And, we, you know, we've been doing these LL courses and, and it's, that's all about um, healing and restoration and it's something that we all need. And so, you know... Things that have happened in the past sometimes need to be dealt with and we need freedom for it. But in closing this morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to impart a blessing over the fathers that are here this morning and the fathers that are online. I'd just like to impart a blessing. You know, um, 
we need a grace anointing of the Spirit of God to uh, be the fathers uh, to our children, to be the grandfathers to our grandchildren and um, the mentors and spiritual fathers to uh, spiritual children. And so, far, and so I'd like to just impart that blessing uh, upon us this morning. And uh, it's not saying that the women are not important. It's not saying that the mothers are not important, but we're celebrating Father's Day today. So what I'd like to do is I'd like for all the fathers in the church to stand. Even if, you're, uh, even if you're not married and you haven't had children, I'd want you to stand too um, because there's the potential of, of fatherhood there. And I just want to pray a blessing over you this morning, a blessing uh, and, and a strengthening of your lives. And so, Father, we just thank you this morning that you are our Father. It is you that is, has um, given us the, the, the way that, that uh, fathers should be. A father should be one that loves totally. One, that, a father that loves unconditionally. And Father, we know that as earthly fathers, we haven't always uh, fulfilled that requirement. But Father, we, uh, and, and we ask for forgiveness, Father, for the times that we have failed in our own fathering role. And Father, we know that you forgive us. And so, Father, I just declare a blessing over, uh, over each one here that's standing and for all those uh, fathers or potential fathers and grandfathers uh, that are online. I just pray that you're that the hand of God might be upon your life, that there might be a grace anointing upon your life to uh, have that influence in, the, in uh, the, the lives of those that are under your care. Grandfathers are important, fathers are important, and spiritual fathers are important. And so, Father, may your blessing, your blessing rest upon each one. May there be uh, that ability to be able to bring influence into the lives of children. Influence for good. And so, Father, may your blessing rest upon each one. May your peace just be upon each one this morning as they rest in you. And Father, for... Everyone here this morning, we just declare that your peace and your enabling and your presence might go with each one. For the mothers, uh, for whoever they are, Father, here this morning, we just declare your love and your blessing and your peace upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Phil. What a wonderful time of sharing. And I just want to thank um, Gary and Chris and David and Phil for just being, you know, um, raw and honest and transparent. Um, I'm sure it's spoken to different people in different ways. Um, but I just... Um, the most important thing that we remember is our Heavenly Father. So as we celebrate Father's Day today, just remember your Heavenly Father somewhere in there and, and give him thanksgiving for, because he has given us so much. Um, please join us for a cup outside and some fellowship. Um, and for those that are maybe leaving early to celebrate um, Father's Day with somebody, um, may God richly bless, you, bless your time together. Yeah. Um, and, and as you go this week, be reminded you can have a confidence before God that as you follow his way, he is faithful to his promises and what he promises his people. Hey? Amen. Amen. Enjoy your day. Thank you, everyone.